Okay. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. This is the uh, next installment in our video series on René Guénon's The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times. Today we will be discussing chapter 4 which is entitled quality um, sorry which is entitled spatial quantity and qualified space now this is uh, a further elaboration of the idea of measure and manifestation which was the topic of the previous chapter chapter three um, as I said in the previous video, it's very important to keep straight in your mind this set of um, correspondences which Genon has introduced from the outset of this work. And in the order that he actually presented it, if we, starting from the introduction, it's a question, actually I think the introduction Uh, I should be more, yeah, not even the, just the introduction, but even the editorial note uh, by the um, by the editor. Uh, it starts from there. So we have on the one hand form, and then on the other hand matter. Uh, Again, on uses also essence and substance. Uh, these are the terms he uses most often. But under essence and substance, all sorts of other things are also included. So with essence goes form, quality. Purusha, unity, the Pythagorean numbers, Platonic ideas are also essences. And we will see uh, in chapter 5, in fact, that he also includes mental phenomena. And therefore, corporeal phenomena come under the rubric or under the pole of substance, which also includes matter, quantity, prakriti, multiplicity, um, there was also the notion of the intelligible and noetic versus the sensible and the aesthetic. So these are extremely important notions to constantly keep track of. Now, in chapter three, he introduces the idea of measure um, as related to extension in space. And that's what he's going to talk about here. But space, not in the Cartesian sense, not in the sense of René Descartes and of... Uh, analytic geometry. Descartes wrote a book which is available in English translation in a Dover edition and called the entitled The Geometry of René Descartes. Uh, this book appeared originally if I'm not mistaken in 1600 and what was it 1619? Let's double check. Excuse me, that's 1637. 1637 is when he introduces his notion of geometry. Um, in modern terms, it's called coordinate geometry or analytic geometry. This is just by way of example, an older but still nevertheless excellent textbook on the subject, uh, also in a Dover edition. Um, so this is a geometry that... <laughs> wishes to completely and utterly and thoroughly quanta, quantify space and quantify time. How exactly did he do this? Because it, it's not clear to me how. The way that he does this, this is that he assumes space to be completely empty. He says we have empty space, which is, of course, a ridiculous notion, which, again, I will point out in Chapter 4. And we also have time as just these dis um, uh, as, as instants. In instances, instants, S I N S T A N T S, and these can all be represented as as um, graphically uh, on a coordinate system. That's his great innovation. Right. And so, if we're talking about motion, for example, then um, then time would be the horizontal axis or the x axis, 
and uh, position. Now, in modern physics, they would talk about, you know, the displacement, but, you know, let's just keep it simple. So the distance uh, would be on the y-axis, and so you would plot distance versus time. Um, so Genon is against all of this. And indeed, he identifies many, many of the modern deviations, especially in science, but not just in science. Um, he doesn't talk about this here, but also the whole question of the body-mind dichotomy is, is introduced by Descartes. And so you get, you know, these very confusing notions in the modern day, so-called philosophy of mind, which is another topic. Um, so measure and manifestation, which, which is introduced in chapter three, Measure is then concerned with measure of space, but space seen symbolically as the uh, representing all manifestation, the domain domain of universal manifestation. He talks about that on page 26, which is in chapter three. All right. So if um, you need to go back and review those, you can watch the video uh, on chapter three. So now jumping into chapter four. Spatial quantity and qualified space. So here he begins by reiterating that extension is not purely and simply a mere mode of quantity. That is to say, extension also has a qualitative aspect. He says this must be insisted on again because it is particularly important in that it reveals the insufficiency of Cartesian mechanism. This is the first page of chapter 4, which happens to be page 31. And of the other physical theories derived more or less directly from it in modern times. So space is not purely quantity. It's not purely quantified. In other words, the notion that you just have these points in an empty space and that it's entirely homogeneous is just not true. Uh, he says that if space was purely quantitative, it would have to be entirely homogeneous, which would mean that its parts would be indistinguishable from one another. Um by any characteristic other than the respective sizes. And this would amount to conceiving of it, in other words, of space, as no more than a container without content. So this idea of a completely quantified or quantitative and completely homogeneous space is something which Guénon rejects. Now he says, well, can we still ask the question? He says, the question may be put at least with some appearance of reason. Is it still not a reasonable question? In other words, he means to say, uh, to ask whether geometrical space, the space of Euclidean geometry, can be conceived of as endowed with some such homogeneity. All right, he says, okay, that still may be a reasonable question. But whatever may be the answer to that question, again, on further states, no such conception of homogeneity is compatible with physical space. So it's one thing to conceive of some kind of an abstract model. If you just want to generate abstractions, you're more than welcome to do so. But such an abstract, utterly and completely homogeneous, purely quantitative space is not compatible. That's, that is to say it is not a true representation of our physical space. Because our physical space is not homogeneous, it's not completely empty. To state the obvious, it contains myriad, any number of myriads of any, myriads and myriads of things and objects, bodies, corporeal entities, things that have extension. The presence of those bodies suffices to determine qualitative differences between the parts of space they occupy. So in whatever room you happen to find yourself at the moment, there is any number of assorted pieces of furniture and all sorts of other things, and they all stand in relation to one another in some sense or another. Um, and so a particular corner of the room that you happen to be in 
is distinguished from another portion of that room by what is or is not located in each respective space. In one corner, you may have a chair. In another part of the, in the middle of the room, you may have a table. Um, uh, against the wall, you may have a, a TV screen, a refrigerator, an oven, a dishwasher, so on and so on and so forth. So the presence of such bodies determines qualitative differences between the parts of space they occupy. And Descartes, writes again on, was undoubtedly thinking of physical space. Descartes is a scientist in a very, mm -hmm. in a, in a very important sense. He's, 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 the, he's a, really the first modern scientist. And so he's interested in what he sees as the world, the universe. Of course, they reduce it just down to mere empirical reality what can be seen, what can be measured, but he is thinking of physical space. Otherwise, his theory would not really mean anything. Uh, he himself, even though he's engaging in abstractions, is not interested in purely mental abstractions. Now, it's quite another thing that he takes his model to be the truth, or sorry, to be an, an adequate representation, to be true in as much as it represents adequately what physical physical the physical universe so in descartes view the whole nature of those things which are there in physical space corporeal entities bodies he reduces the whole nature of bodies we're on page 32 now to extension all right So since Descartes reduces the whole nature of bodies to extension, he is compelled thenceforth to suppose that their presence add nothing to what space itself already is. So in the eyes of Descartes, the diverse properties of corporeal entities, of bodies, is nothing more, in his view, than mere modifications of extension. Length, width, height, surface... But if that be so, continues Genon, whence can these properties come unless they are in some way inherent in extension itself? And how can they be so inherent if the nature of extension is lacking in any qualitative elements? How is he using extension here? In what sense that, that an object like this phone It's not a can, point. It's, it's not its own it's not point. A G, it's not a Euclidean point. I see that you ascribe. That phone or that book or that uh, whatever the object it is, if it is a body, it cannot be a, a, an abstract mathematical point. It has to have some sort of length and width and depth. And so that's why he's reducing the total the, the, the uh, body to, to extension, to the totality okay. of the reality of, of bodies to extension. So I'm, it's not clear to me still. So if, if this phone is taking up some amount of space. Mm -hmm. It takes up a volume and a, and a surface. The phone is taking up the space. It's yes. not... The, the space exists without the phone existing. Yeah, Ganon would say that it's meaningless to speak of an empty space because there is no such thing. We don't have mm -hmm. an empty space. The modern scientists often Similar talk, to like Lucretius's void, for example. There isn't any. Yeah. Um, according to Ganon, he does not see it that way. So he sees okay. this as, as as a contradiction. He says, well, I mean, if it's not obvious that it's a contradiction, he says, here there is something very like contradiction. Um, and he says that these, these kind of contradictory notions are implicit in the work of Descartes. Uh, he accuses Descartes and, and, and um, the materialists of his day as trying to extract the greater from the lesser. To say that a body, again on the bottom of page, near the bottom of page 32, to say that a body is nothing but extension in a purely quantitative sense is really the same as to say that its surface and its volume, which measure the portion of extension. Do you understand? So no. if you have, if you have, let's say your phone again, it's mm -hmm. sitting on a table. And if you reduce that to mere extension, it has a surface and a volume. So the portion which touches the table. That's the surface? 
that's not the entirety of the surface. It's the surface which is touching the table because uh-huh. the, the that phone this this part maybe if you want to take this totally into a Cartesian dimension uh, manner of expression, yeah. is a rectangular parallelopiped. Okay. And the base of the rectangular parallelopiped is uh, coincides with a portion of the plane of the table. Okay. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, the parallelopiped from its base extends to a certain height. Uh, and that gives it the dimension of volume when you also consider its other two dimensions of length and width. Okay. And for Descartes, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. Okay. To say that a body is nothing but extension in a purely quantitative sense is really the same as to say that its surface and its volume which measure the portion of extension actually occupied by it are the body itself with all its properties. Now we know that that's not true. He says, which is manifestly absurd. So clearly your phone has a color at the moment. It'll have some sort of surface temperature. Um, it's composed of various parts. Uh, the screen is glass. You have some kind of a cover, which is some kind of a plastic. Plastic is is a, is a petrochemical product. The glass is another thing, and, and so on and so forth. And they all have their various. So there's more to in, it in, than in, just even surface. in terms of modern science. They have their chemical properties. They have they have a, a, a whole range of physical properties. Now, does that really amount to extension? No. Maybe you could argue that it does. So you're just saying that there's more to this phone than surface and volume. That's what. But is that that's what, what he is saying? Yes. Is that what? Does Descartes really just reduce every object to just its surface and its volume? Doesn't he? I feel like he would concede that there is more to an object than just. Well, I th- there might be some oversimplification here. I think right. that Descartes is going in the dir- it was discussing in terms of mechanics. Okay. So if you if you want to, <clears throat> we can model this. If we if we want to model the motion of this phone, if we threw it. Mm-hmm. If we threw it across a field or across a room, then we treat it as a point. Then you would you would actually treat it as a point, and you would say that it has a certain mass, and it has a certain according to Descartes. Yes, and it ha- well according to modern physics, and that's okay. the direction that you know they, it all goes back to Descartes. Mm-hmm. So that phone would have a certain mass, and because of uh, we're on the planet Earth, and it has a certain gravi- uh, acceleration of gravity which is 32 feet per second per second, or 9.8 meters per second squared, um, then you would take its mass, whatever it is, times the acceleration of gravity, you would get its weight. There are various other mathematical relationships that are derived from uh, calculus, uh, the Newtonian mechanics, that would then describe the motion, neglecting air resistance. These are all the things that they do in a typical high school physics, really. Mm -hmm. But these notions originally all go back to Descartes. You know, uh, uh, people like Aristotle did not think of motion this way. Oh, no, um, definitely not. Um, uh, this is an innovation introduced by Newton. Uh, you know, Nacido di Notusi does not speak of motion in this way. It's very much a, a completely different notion, which goes back to Aristotle. But we're getting a little off the mm-hmm. topic, but simply to say that it's really with Descartes that you have this kind of reduction to quantity when it comes to bodies. So he says this is manifestly absurd. In other words, that uh, that 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 um, that um, uh, a body is nothing but extension. Geno means to, is, is, says is manifestly absurd. Therefore, some other interpretation must be sought, and it becomes impossible to avoid the admission that extension itself is in some way qualitative. That's really the point he's trying to make here. He's trying to say that there is something qualitative in extension as well. So don't get hung up too much on this question of the bodies and. Mm-hmm. He's, say, he's saying that you know if you want to take Descartes' view that the body is pure extension, this leads to problems. And it's a manifestly absurd notion. And so there is something more to space extension. Let's go back where he introduces this thing. So he says, the insufficiency of Cartesian mechanism. So we are right. talking about mechanics, you see. Okay. So, but Ginnon doesn't really go into detail here. He just sort of says it in passing. Um, is there a footnote here? 
There are footnotes. Yeah, there's So two. the first footnote is, it is true that Descartes at the beginning of his physics only claims to construct a hypothetical world on the basis of certain assumptions which can be reduced to extension and movement. So in the Cartesian universe, you only have matter in motion, and matter in the form of bodies is just extension. So it's just extension and movement. Um, this is the classic situation where you have a person confusing the abstract model that they have constructed of the world with the world itself. Um, now, where is the footnote on atomism? It's right under that, on the same page. Yeah, but what does it oh. refer to? That, that's what I mean. That's uh, towards I, the top. Yeah. We're, uh, not being a possibility of manifestation. Right. Right there. So when he negates, uh, when he rejects the concept of empty space, he says that um, it would be useless to object that empty space is only the starting point of his theory, that's Descartes, because in the first place this would lead back to the conception of a container without content, implying an emptiness that can have no place in the manifested world, emptiness as such not being a possibility of manifestation. So the notion of a completely empty space is a mere abstraction. And he says that this argument in the footnote at the bottom of page 32 also is equally applicable to uh, atomistic theories or, or, ad or the theories of atomism, which by definition admit no positive existence other than that of atoms. So it in introduces a kind of discreteness, a quantization into the nature of things. And that means that there has to be an empty space a void a between void the atoms where they all move around yeah and, so yeah. this argument he says applies to atomism as well but he doesn't uh it elaborate or, or develop this theme further he just relegates it to a footnote he moves further moves ahead with his his uh discussion so without going into too much detail he simply says that these considerations by themselves are sufficient to establish or to show that cartesian physics cannot be valid they are still not sufficient to establish firmly the qualitative character of extinction. Okay, so he says that extinction does have a qualitative character, but he has to do a little bit more work to, to make his point. So even though the nature of bodies cannot be reduced to extension and, and extension alone, uh, this is just because they derive nothing from extension other than their quantitative elements. But at this point, he says, the, another observation comes into play becomes pertinent among the corporeal determinations this is page 33 which are undeniably of a purely spatial order and which can therefore rightly be regarded as modifications of extension there is not only this is a very important point mm -hmm. there is not only the size of bodies their surface right and their volume what mm -hmm. they actually occupy and how much that surface and volume is you can have a small object you can have a large object yeah but their orientation, or actually he says situation, not orientation, but also their situation. And he means it, situation in the sense of where it is, where the object is. The, Aristot the, the Aristotelian predicament or category of relation. Relatio, yeah. relatio. Right. Al-Ilbafa in Arabic. Yeah. I'm jumping ahead here, but in the next chapter he says something similar about Mm -hmm. the movement of time and the essence of of the where your where your place is in time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's yes. interesting i didn't that's make that true. connection when i first read that's that that's an important connection so surface and volume is not sufficient but there's also situation by which he also means direction and also of course that would i i think would also include uh, it, it includes orientation all right now, there could be a rebuttal by the Cartesians, uh, the quant the, those who are obsessed with quantifying and quanti quantification. The partisans of reduction to quantity, writes Kenon, will doubtless reply that the situation of a plurality of bodies is defined by their distances. So if you have an assemblage of objects in a room, or let's say on a table, uh, and by room or table, I just mean some portion of space. You have mm -hmm. an assemblage of objects. You can define their relationship to one another by their distances, by their relative distances from one another. So the distance of the chair uh, from the table uh, 
and the phone from the briefcase and the briefcase from the pencil and the pencil from the inkwell and so forth. So these distances, these relative distances, are without doubt instances of what? Quantity. Mm -hmm. They're separated by so many centimeters, for example. The quantity of extension that lies between them, between these objects, just as their size is the quantity of extension that they occupy. So, but Genon asks, but is distance sufficient by itself to define the situation of bodies in space? So he doesn't consider this. But what about the orientation? What if the book is upside down? What if you have a glass on a table and it's upside down? That's orientation relative to uh, a local vertical, mm -hmm. some, vert some vertical axis, <clears throat> whereby you, you know, if you're standing on your head, it's not upside down. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean by the concept of the vertical. Um, so that's another, uh, concept. Um, and what if you just have an assemblage of shapes, Le um, of, 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 or let's not make, let's make an actual thing. Let's say you have, a, um, a, uh, number of books arrayed on a table in a library. Okay. So the book if they are, let's say that they're written in a language which is written from left to right. So a book has a normal orientation in that sense. Mm -hmm. So what if it's flipped over so that the back cover is facing the person looking down on the table? Or what if they are all arranged, not just, uh, let's say they're arranged on the table such that they're, uh, the lengths and widths of the, t of the books are not parallel to the length and width of the table. So let's say it's just put at a diagonal. That's a rotation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he didn't consider these, but that's what I'm saying. Direction uh, or situation would also include maybe orientation. What if the books were stood up on their spines? Mm -hmm. What if uh, you have 15 books and they're all piled up on top of each other? What if you have them piled up in a weird shape, like uh, in some odd configuration, something like a house of cards? Why is this important? It's important because extension is not enough, and uh, the parts of space that they occupy is not enough, because extension is part of that. Mm -hmm. But their orientation as well, their direction is also very important. The point he's trying to make is that if you want to really talk about space... You have to include direction. And so he concludes that space is an assemblage of directional tendencies. This comes later. Okay. So the partisans of reduction to quantity will doubtless reply that the situation of, of a plurality of bodies is defined by their distances, and the distance is certainly a quantity. The quantity of extension that lies between them, just as their, si as their size is the quantity of extension that they occupy. But is distance sufficient by itself to define the situation of bodies in space? That's where we'd read up to. This is something else that cannot possibly be left out of account, and that is the direction along which distance must be measured. So you can measure distance in different directions. So he doesn't really talk about this, but there is the notion of a vector. In other words, a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Mm -hmm. um, so all of this discussion, he says, implies that per particular directions in space are in no way distinguished from one another. So if direction is an effective element in situation, and if it is a purely spatial element as it evidently is, and no less so than distance, then there must be something qualitative in the very nature of space. For Genon direction which is part of situation is not quantitative so mm -hmm. the relationships of up and down above and below left and right are not quantitative in modern mathematics they are yeah because they introduced the notion of negative number so if you have a line the number line and you have a zero and then you go in the right hand direction by convention this is a convention this is the positive numbers. To the left, it's the negative numbers. We could have flipped the convention, had negative this way. That is, the scientists would also say, arbitrary. You know, in traditional metaphysics, no. Directions have a meaning, right and left, in the Quran. Ashabul yameen, ashabul shimal. 
Yamin, Shimal, you know, left and right. Occident. And also orientation. I did a whole video on why we walk around the Kaaba in a counterclockwise direction. In other religions, there's a different... They they circumambulate the right of circumambulation in different yeah. traditions is clockwise and some it's counterclockwise. Genan has an article on it. It's referenced there. If you haven't seen that video, it's in office hours. Um, so that's also a question of orientation. Um, so direction is important, and direction for him is not a quantitative matter, although for modern mathematics it is. And the same would go for rotation. A clockwise rotation, they would define. If you have a particular problem... Mm -hmm. some sort of physics problem you can define your your coordinate system you can say that counterclockwise is positive which is the is the is the standard convention and uh, clockwise is negative um you could define it the other way you in physics problems sometimes it makes more sense to define down as positive and so your axes are arranged that way this is very common in, in physics and engineering problems in mechanics to define a coordinate axis, uh, your coordinate axes, so it's um, convenient to solving the problem due to certain mathematical mm -hmm. considerations. So if you define down as positive in yeah. the physics problem, you can avoid the negative numbers. Uh, and that's often important because you need to finish this exam, you don't want to deal with negative numbers, you want to finish the problem quickly, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but none of that comes in here. <laughs> None of that comes in here. This is all, you know, physics and uh, engineering problems. Okay. So, um, so he introduces the notion of, of situation. Then he introduces another concept, which uh, also talks uh, about or addresses the question of space not being purely quantitative. He's arguing for a qualified space rather than a quantified space. He says you can have spatial quantity, but we're talking more about a qualified space, hence the title of the chapter. So he says that... Um, He's talking about, he then shifts to a discussion of, of, of um, what he calls, you know, the profane geometry of the moderns. And that this is what is under consideration here. Let it be clearly understood that only, bottom of page 33, that only the profane geometry of the moderns is now under consideration. And the question may at once be asked whether if there proves to be anything in profane geometry that cannot be reduced to quantity, does it not immediately follow that it is even less possible and less legitimate to claim to reduce everything in the domain of the physical sciences to quantity? So if you think about Euclidean geometry, there is uh, something there which also uh, has something to do with situation. So he says even the question of situation can, can, can be left out here uh, because it only plays a really conspicuous part in certain special branches of geometry. Sorry, he's, so he's leaving it out. Uh, which might perhaps be regarded as not constituting a strictly integral part of pure geometry. But in the most elementary geometry, not only has the size of figures to be taken into account, but also their shape. Uh, we'll deal with the footnote in a minute. So size of figures, you have to understand that in Euclidean geometry, measure is fundamental. We spoke about this, I think, in the previous lecture. Yeah. And so in Euclidean geometry, you have a notion of measure or distance, or what's called a metric, and that's Proposition 47 from Book 1, which is the Pythagorean Theorem. Um, and I said that there's a kind of geometry where you can dispense with measurement called projective geometry. I talked about that. But even in Euclidean geometry, where you have a notion of distance, a metric, there, is, there are qualitative considerations that come into view in profane Euclidean geometry. I think the original geometry of Euclid, Euclid is certainly not profane. He says the profane geometry of the moderns. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the notion of similarity. You can have congruent triangles. You can prove that a triangle, one triangle is congruent to another. That would mean that if you could pick it up, it would fit on top of it perfectly mm -hmm. once you lined, the, lined up the sides, the angles. So 
in Euclidean geometry, they have various theorems, which are typically called SSS or side, 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 which means you show that each of the sides are equal. Mm -hmm. Or you have side, angle, side. So you have two sides and the angle included. Or you have angle, angle, side. You have the two angles and the side that's included. And that establishes that the two triangles are congruent. But then you have something called similarity. Mm -hmm. Similarity has to do with shape. And that's a qualitative consideration, although there you can reduce it to quantity. If we're talking about triangles, if they all have the same angles, if all three angles are congruent, angle, 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 they are similar. They may also be congruent if all the sides are. So angle, angle, angle is sufficient to prove similarity. It is necessary, sorry, is necessary but not sufficient. It's necessary mm -hmm. but not sufficient. So, you know, um, so if all of the angles are equal, but the sides aren't, then they're similar. If all the sides are equal yeah. and all the angles are equal, right? And this is, this is qualitative. Well, this is what he calls a shape. Okay. So on the one hand, you have the size of figures, that's congruency, that's distance, but also their shape. So he says, but in the most elementary geometry, not only has the size of figures to be taken into account, but also their shape. And would any geometri geometrician however deeply imbued with modern conceptions, dare to maintain, for example, that a triangle and a square of equal area are one and the same thing. So there he introduces another idea. So there you, you cannot have one triangle similar to, to a square, but you could have a given triangle having the same area as a square. Mm -hmm. So if you're given some square of side S, the area of the square is, is S squared. And if you have some triangle with some base and some height, the area would be one half the base times the height. And so it is possible for the area of, of a given triangle to be the same as, an er as the area of a given square, in which case one half of the base times the height would equal S squared. And so the side would be the square root of base times height divided by two, the square root of all of that. So they have the same area, but they're not the same shape. One is a triangle and one is a square. Mm -hmm. So you can't reduce it to pure quantity. Um, similarly, you could have two shapes that have the same perimeter. You could have a parallelogram. You could have a trapezoid that has the same perimeter as an isosceles triangle, but they're not the same shape. So this notion of shape is qualitative. So he says, would any geometrician, ge geometrician, however deeply imbued with modern conceptions, dare to maintain, for example, that a triangle and a square of equal area are one and the same thing? He would only say that they are equivalent, area, speaking in terms of the area, but he would clearly be leaving out as being understood the words in respect of size. And he would have to recognize that in another respect, namely that of shape, there is something that differentiates them. And the reason for which equivalence in size does not carry with it similitude of shape is that there is something in shape that precludes it being reduced to quantity. You see. Mm -hmm. And now he talks about similar figures. So this is not all, for there is a whole section of elementary geometry to which quantitative considerations are strange, namely the theory of similar figures Similarity is in fact defined exclusively by shape and is wholly independent of the size of figures and so on. So we, we introduce that first. And he brings it in later. If we now care to inquire into the essential nature of spatial shape, it will be found to be definable as an assemblage of directional tendencies. At every point in a line, its directional tendency is specified by a tangent. And the assemblage of all tangents defines the shape of the line. That could even be a curve. Mm -hmm. When he says a curve, it could be a curved line. Okay. And if you if you if you find all of the tangents, all of the lines, straight lines, tangent to the curve, you will map out the curve. Uh, and similarly, for a three-dimensional shape, you would have tangent curves. So if we now care to inquire into the essential nature of spatial shape, it will be found to be definable as an assemblage of directional tendencies. At every point in a line, its directional tendency is specified by a tangent, and the assemblage of all tangents defines the shape of the line. In three-dimensional geometry, the same is true of surfaces. 
straight line tangents being replaced by plane tangents. It is moreover evident <clears throat> that the shape of all bodies as well as that of simple geometric figures can be similarly defined for the shape of a body is the shape of the surface by which its volume is delimited. <clears throat> okay, before we go to the conclusion that he's tending toward, in footnote three, when he first introduces the notion of, that's um, uh, when he talks about aspect other other kinds of geometry he's just saying that there's something called descriptive geometry that's another kind of geometry and um some mathematicians have given it the name of an analysis situs i don't think anybody uses this terminology anymore today this is called differential geometry i'm not sure what the situation was in the time of Ganon, but anyhow if you know what that is, fine. If you don't know what it is, it's not going to make any difference to the understanding of what he's saying here. Um, if you're really curious, you can look it up online, but unless you've studied calculus, you're not going to understand differential geometry. <laughs> so so where is, is he going with all of this? The conclusion toward which all this leads could be foreseen when the situation of bodies was being discussed, namely that it is the notion of direction that without doubt represents the real qualitative element inherent in the very nature of space. So that is the whole essence and kernel of this chapter. That space is also qualitative and the qualitative element which is inherent in the very nature of space is direction. Is direction. Okay. So that's the qualitative element what's the quantitative element inherent in space distance okay the qualitative dimension is inherent in space Qual sorry the qualitative element inherent in space is direction, direction and the quantitative element inherent in space is distance so space is not homogeneous space properly understood, according to Genon, is determined and differentiated by its directions. What does he mean by homogeneous here? That every part of the space is the same. Okay. That's what homogeneous means. It's not. And so space, properly understood, is what he calls qualified space. That is to say, space determined and differentiated by its directions. That space is to be seen as an assemblage of directional tendencies. So not only from the physical point of view, he says then, but also from the geometrical point of view, the uh, qualified space is actually the real space. Homogeneous space doesn't exist. It's a mere abstraction. It's a mere virtuality, he says. In order that it may be measured, in other words, in order that space may be measured, and this means according to the explanations given in order to be effectively realized, space must necessarily be related to an assemblage of directional, of defined directions, excuse me. These directions, moreover, present themselves as radii. They present themselves to us as radii emanating from a center which thus becomes the center of a three-dimensional cross. In other words, you have above and below, up and down. That's a vertical. Mm -hmm. You have left and right. That's another axis. And then you have depth. We could in front and back, forward and backward. So you have a three-dimensional sort of coordinate system. But it's not the three-dimensional coordinate system of Descartes, which, is, which he wants to make into pure quantity. And the reason, the way they pull that off is with positive, with negative numbers, with the, with the so-called integers of modern mathematics, denoted by capital Z or Z in uh, modern mathematical notation. Um, he's calling them radii, so you could even think of them that way. Um, they are radii in the sense that, imagine if you have a ball or a sphere, 
So then you have the vertical is the axis of rotation, let's say of the, of one of the axes of rotation of the sphere and then perpendicular to that and then perpendicular to those two. But you also have other radii emanating out. Uh, and there are different kinds of coordinate systems also. If it's just on a flat plane, there's something called polar coordinates. Mm -hmm. So if you think of a graph paper and you've got vertical and horizontals and these, these are your X and Y coordinates, you can also have polar coordinates where, whereby every point is defined as lying on a radius at a, at a fixed distance from the center, which is a circle. So instead of squares, little squares on a piece of graph paper, you have concentric circles. And you can also have spherical coordinates. You can have cylindrical coordinates. You can have curvilinear coordinates. There are many, many coordinate systems that have been developed, for better or worse, mm -hmm. <laughs> after uh, Descartes. But if you understand them the way that Genon is arguing, then all of them are instances of a kind of, of all of them are instances of 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 um, uh, axes that have direction, and so they are part of they are uh, explanations or elaborations of qualified space, not spatial quantity. That's the key of this chapter. So that's really the point he wants to make. He then says that, um, you know, it, it may not be too much to suggest, he says, perhaps, that if the study of the directions of space could be restored to its rightful position of importance, it might become possible to restore to geometry at least a considerable part of the profound meaning that it has lost. So again, this is the notion of direction and orientation. And uh, this was extremely important in traditional societies. He elaborates upon this in footnote six. Uh, before that, in footnote five, he says that if you want to understand these uh, directional tendencies, these um, this three-dimensional cross, you should read his book, The Symbolism of the Cross. But in, in, in footnote six, the notion of orientation is very important. And you have to understand that in sacred geometry in ancient times, this was intimately related to architecture. He said that in a previous chapter as well. So buildings had an orientation. That's even true today for Muslims. Everything even, faces Mecca, yeah. even if even if it's if it's a modern mosque, it has to face it has to be oriented in the direction of Mecca. Mm -hmm. um, there were other very important orientations and alignments of ancient temples and sites, and there's an entire area uh, of a, albeit a modern field, and that is the field of archaeoastronomy. But again, it's reduced to quantity. It's reduced to <laughs> it has all sorts of you know, ideas which Genon would not accept. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that they recognized that these buildings had an orientation, whether they understand what that means is another matter. But this was extremely important. And you find this in old manuals of architecture, like the books of Vitruvius and uh, works on of a similar nature in traditional civilizations, like in the Indic civilization on the orientation of Hindu temples and the layout and the geometry. Um, and you find in ancient China, for example, the science of feng shui, mm -hmm. how you uh, arrange elements in space. So even their situation is not neutral. And in the Indian tradition, you have the, um, an analog of feng shui, which is called vastu shastra. So space, as well as time, writes going on the bottom of page 35, is one of the conditions defining corporeal existence, but these conditions are not themselves matter, or rather not themselves quantity, though they accommodate themselves naturally to quantity. <clears throat> they are less substantial than it, and so nearer to essence. So if you understand what he means by qualified space and you see so then you see that space is not merely can is not merely reducible to quantity or to mere extension then you see that it has a qualitative aspect as well and so that it is in fact if you look at it from this point of view if you understand this point of view uh, 
<clears throat> you see that space is more towards the pole of essence and this is the same this all this is the same truth in relation to time which he looks at in the next chapter here he then uh notes the absurdity of uh, something which was introduced by Immanuel Kant in his uh, antinomies. He says it's enough to expose the absurdity of one of Kant's two famous cosmological antinomies to ask whether the world is infinite or whether it is limited within space. Um, so if you want to look into this, you can uh, read more about Kant and his antinomies, but you don't really have to to understand what he's saying here. The, the idea in question that Kant um, was putting forward um, was uh, to ask a question. And you know, why he's asking this, because that has, that has to do with his, this whole idea of, his, of the cosmological antinomies, which we're not concerned with. Just look at the question. The question is, is the world infinite? Or finite in other words is the universe is it an infinite universe or is it a finite universe finite would mean limited in space he says that this question whether it is posed in the form of kant's cosmological one of kant's cosmological antinomies or is posed by modern cosmologists which you know they come after after get on you know people like stephen hawking and others mm -hmm. he says this isn't a meaningless this is a meaningless question Kant's antinomy is meaningless space cannot possibly extend beyond the world in order to contain it now get on it discusses at length his understanding of infinity in his book on the principle metaphysical principles of the infinitesimal calculus so he was very much against the notion of infinity as it's found in modern mathematics and yes, he wrote a long time ago, but that stuff was already there. It's not something that was discovered, you know, five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Genon says that, you know, that uh, Genon says that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the actual infinite. And everything else is just potential infinities. And so to speak of an infinite space is ridiculous. Space cannot possibly extend beyond the world in order to contain it. Because an empty space would then be in question and emptiness cannot contain anything. So for Genon, it is space that is in the world. Space is in manifestation. And if consideration be confined to the domain of corporeal manifestation alone, it can be said that space is coextensive with this world space coincides with this universe why because space is one of its conditions but the universe this world he says is no more infinite than space is itself so if you want to talk about infinite space as descartes does again it's an abstraction it's just a mental entity it does not have mm -hmm. any external instantiation so this world is no more infinite than is space itself for like space it that is to say this world this universe does not contain every possibility but only represents a certain particular order of possibilities and is limited by the determinations that constitute its very nature So he is just rejecting with a very concise, a few, just a few sentences, the notion of infinite space. Now, because he's interested in both space and time and how both of these have, have, have been um, distorted into monstrosities in the modern understanding of things in the reign of quantity, so now he turns to a similar problem that relates to 
time. So it's no less absurd, according to Genon, to ask the question of the eternity of the world. You know, is the world eternal or did it have a beginning in time? And this is absurd for closely comparable reasons to, to why you don't have infinite space. The truth is, he writes, that time began in the world. Whenever universal manifestation is concerned, or with the world, when corporeal manifestation alone is concerned. Very nice sentence. But the world is not therefore eternal. For there are beginnings outside of time. The world is not eternal because it is contingent. It can't be eternal because it is mumkin. It is contingent. Mm. It is not a wajib. It is not necessary. In other words, it has a beginning as well as an end because it is not itself its own principle. It's only the necessary being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wajibul wujud, that is the principle of the cosmos. In other words, it, the universe, the world, the cosmos, has a beginning as well as an end because it is not itself its own principle or because it does not contain its principle in itself. That principle being necessarily transcendent with respect to it. So these two questions about whether space is finite or infinite and whether the universe is eternal or has a beginning in time are examples of meaningless questions and they are the products of the confusion he speaks, he, he calls it, which is characteristic of the mentality of today, the mentality of the moderns. And so he uses this to very nicely then move into the theme of the next chapter which is devoted to time and that is entitled the qualitative determinations of time and we will look at that one in the next video thank you for watching